What was the most surprising thing for for each of you while working on this documentary? Surprising or outraging? It's the fact that these families in Gaza still have faith in, that talking to the media may change something for them. I mean, they really have no reason to talk to journalists. They've been through the absolute worst, most horrific experiences imaginable. And yet they've still decided to tell their stories. And I think, you know, people have different reasons. Some of them want to honor their loved ones, but they're doing so not just in the midst of their overwhelming grief and sorrow and um, pain and sometimes physical pain from their injuries, but also just trying to stay alive. I mean, you know, dealing with starvation conditions, being repeatedly displaced we're not talking about being displaced once or twice. We're talking about some people have now been displaced like dozens of times. It's just unfathomable. Um, and yet they still sat down and spoke to our cameras and were really open and, you know, decided to kind of recount the worst days of their life lives. Um, and I just... I don't know, to me, like as a journalist for over 20 years, the amount of begging and pleading and negotiating for sources to talk to you. And yet these people who've been through the worst, who are going through the worst, actually deciding to sit down and tell their stories. I, I find that remarkable and surprising. It's also um, scary. I mean, a lot of these families um, see that journalists are being targeted. Um, you know, some 150 journalists have been killed by Israel since October. And um, that's, you know, 75% of the journalists killed in 2023 were killed in Gaza. Um, so that's not only something that's dangerous for journalists themselves, they, they say that they feel they have a target on their back. Some of them have stopped wearing their flak vests and their protective helmets because they think that that puts a target on their backs. But a lot of just regular people in Gaza feel that talking to journalists puts them at risk. So, um, you know, I just think it's it's incredibly courageous that these um, families um, decided to speak to us and tell their stories with the hope that maybe something will change. Maybe people will watch the film and feel something. Maybe especially Americans whose tax dollars are funding this. And what about you, Kavita, in terms of the most um, surprising or infuriating the most infuriating thing, honestly, it's it's mostly seeing it's, you know, not necessarily what we learned in the documentary, but watching the way the rest of the media, particularly Western media, have covered this war and the kind of lack of respect and care for journalists in Gaza. I feel like our industry has really let them down. Actually, I think that's, that's too kind a of way of saying it, um, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, I think that's what I find infuriating is seeing, you know, there's always a lot of, uh, you know, people rightly talk about how Israel is not allowing um, journalists into Gaza. We should be talking about that. And it is horrible because more journalists should be let in. However, I feel like when people talk about that, they, it's almost acting as though there aren't journalists there doing this work, covering what's happening, showing the world what's happening. Um, and it's... Um, Layla's heard me rant about this a lot, but like, you know, one of the things that really stood out to me was, you know, just like looking at media coverage is that when the campus protests like kind of really kicked off in about, I want to say mid to late April, there were various points in which um, CNN, they were doing like wall to wall coverage of the protests, but at no point do they mention what the students are protesting. Um, and what's happening in Gaza. CNN had a, they did a phone interview with a student journalist at UT, which is great. The student journalist was amazing. Student journalists have actually been better, were better at covering the protests than mainstream media, obviously. Um, but I, I was watching that thinking, if you can do a phone interview with that student, you can do a phone interview with journalists in Gaza. You know what? They can, like a lot of these, even though communication isn't great, there are ways to do it. And they do have coverage at different points. So you can get voice notes. There are ways if you really want to, right? And it's clear that they don't want to cover this war. Not, that's, yeah. that's what it is and continues to be frustrating to, inf infuriating to me. And can you guys talk more about the Western media's complicity in Israel's war? I mean, how genocide. much time do you have? 
Yeah. <laughs> However much you, I know, right. It would be, it could be a, a one week, 24 seven marathon, but uh, I guess uh, prioritizing the most uh, egregious examples. I mean, unfortunately from the beginning, you know, you've seen sort of a, a pattern of, of, I would say, you know, it, it sort of falls in two buckets. You see um, sometimes outright complicity in terms of um, sort of perpetuating or spreading um, the Israeli official government narrative, which oftentimes is these like sensationalistic, unverified, unsubstantiated allegations and claims that then quickly fall apart under even the smallest bit of scrutiny. But they're usually tied to something to kind of justify the ongoing mass killing and maiming in Gaza. So, of course, we've seen, you know, example after example of this. Hamas uh, using Al Shifa Hospital as a command uh, node. Of course, that falls apart. Hamas weaponized mass rape in Gaza. You know, New York Times front page story screams about words on December 28th. That falls apart. I mean, that story fell apart so much that every major source in that story was proven to have lied. And yet that story remains uncorrected on the New York Times website. That is a travesty. That is an embarrassment. That is a monumental journalistic failure. Um, there's no reason that story should stand on the New York Times website unretracted. Um, and Cheryl you just have, did a documentary about it, making regurgitating the same debunked claims. Exactly, that the White House is 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 apparently screaming. Right. I mean, it is unacceptable. And then you have, you know, the day of the ICJ ruling, say, finding that there's plausible genocide. You have this lie that UNRWA was somehow involved in October 7th, again, they fail to produce evidence to prove that, right? So you have media uncritically publishing these claims by an Israeli military and government that have been proven to have lied to the media time and again. We saw it in the um, 2021 war on Gaza when they told journalists that they were going to go in and do a ground invasion. And then they later on admitted that they lied, that it was a deliberate lie um, and as a war tactic to get Hamas in the tunnels so they could bomb the tunnels. They admitted that they lied to the media and used them. You saw that with their lies about the killing of Shirin Abu Akla, where they tried to claim that she was first killed by a Palestinian and then killed in crossfire. And it took the diligent reporting of actual, in some cases, corporate media organizations to, to actually find that, no, it was an Israeli soldier who'd killed her. But after what? After they lied you know, for weeks about that, if not months. So you have a source that has lied to the media repeatedly that is then used and trusted by the media as a source, you know, time and again, it's unacceptable. Um, and then you have, as Kavitha mentioned, just the outright under coverage of things in Gaza. So stories that should be front page news, that should be breaking news alerts that don't even make it onto, you know, onto coverage at all. Um, you know, it's really telling what makes it on our phones as breaking news alerts and what doesn't. Palestinians can be killed by the dozens on a daily basis, and it doesn't make a peep. We don't get a breaking news alert. And what does that tell us? That Palestinian life is devalued. It has no value. It has no worth. It's normalized, and we're just expected to accept it. What else do you think is important? I mean, what, what else would you like to touch on during this interview? Because I have so many questions, but you guys have been generous with your time. But just want to know if there's anything you want to make sure we did talk about that you feel like is neglected by the media gosh just the war in general i feel like they have neglect it's just I, it's you would think that there isn't that this war isn't happening the way that they cover it or rather don't cover it like Layla mentioned the amount there's been so few news alerts about it, it just it you know i remember i don't think anything anybody was surprised by this but i remember when the met gala was happening that was the night that they invaded rafa and there were like there was like one news alert i think and that was it right um but it's just the way that you know and this is obviously precedes october 7th um that you know when it comes to palestine the, the media just journalists have fa failed so spectacularly it really like astounds me every single day honestly um my my jaw is just usually just on the floor at the way that they that journal journalists have failed um and i remember just thinking at the beginning when you know in october watching some of the coverage and i just kept thinking wow this is a rock all over again please watch our film because i think you know as kavitha mentioned it felt so overwhelming like how do you cover something that's been happening um that's 
you know, daily horrors, not just daily horror, but daily horrors um, in a comprehensive way. And I just think more than anything, we're hoping that the film just gives people even a small glimpse of the horror that's unfolding in Gaza and, you know, hopefully moves them to um, continue at least bearing witness because that's the least we can do is to bear witness and um, to use whatever platform we have to keep talking about it because while the world may have moved on, the people of Gaza are still experiencing, you know, the worst imaginable horror on a daily basis. And we can't allow people to forget that. Speaking of media malpractice and bias, I'm curious if you guys have any kind of behind the scenes stories, um, maybe you don't want to name names, but kind of the worst things you've experienced, whether that's censorship, pressure not to talk about certain things, killing stories, journalists saying really racist things, just some kind of some, if you could pull back the curtain a little bit on that. I can tell you just through some conversations I've had with people working in, you know, corporate mainstream media, I think there are people in these newsrooms who gen genuinely want to do a good job and genuinely want to be fair. And I think it's important to note that, um, Nobody who's, you know, Palestinian or supports Palestinian rights is actually saying, like, please be biased towards Palestinians. Sure. No one is saying that. They're saying, do your jobs. Be professional. Yeah. Tell the truth. Report a story out. Don't regurgitate what a government official tells you. Don't regurgitate what the Israeli military tells you. Just report the story out. That's it. Don't do anyone any favors, but, you know, just do journalism. So I want to make that clear. And I think there's people in newsrooms who genuinely want to do that. Um, but I also think there's people who, and I think this is oftentimes unconscious bias, who are much more disturbed with the idea of, you know, what happened on October 7th and Israelis being killed um, than they are with Palestinian death and killing, which has become normalized. And I think that really comes out in the way that you know, their journalism is crafted, what stories they choose to tell, the tone and tenor of a story, the placement of a story, whether a story merits a breaking news alert. I'll never forget when Abby Phillip, for example, um, she's just one of many, many, many people, but when she tweeted, don't look away about the I-24 piece on beheaded babies. And then there's been nine months of Palestinian children, at least 15,000 Palestinian children being killed. I just read you know, that 21,000, as many as 21,000 may be missing as well, in addition to the 15,000 killed. Unfathomable numbers. She's never said, don't look away. She's never said, like, this is sad or disturbing, you know, anything comparable. Um, you know, you've seen um, Anderson Cooper tear up about October 7th, but never showing that same kind of emotion towards, um, you know, Palestinians being killed. And then I think about this New Yorker article. Um, it was an interview with Aaron David Miller, who said that, um, you know, the last question he asked, he was asked was, does, um, and he's a former, you know, government official, negoti negotiator, he worked in negotiations, you know, about the Biden administration. He said, like, basically in so many words that Biden doesn't have the same depth of feelings towards Palestinians as he does towards Israelis. And I think it's as simple as that. Um, and a friend of mine put it well back in October. She said, I used to think it was ignorance, but it's racism. And I think we can't really underestimate how that figures, like sort of the hierarchy of life figures into the way that this is all covered. 